How do you see? Just one one little guy and some does out there in the wrong unit. We're right on the boundary. Yeah, they went in the wrong side of the road. This is one of the hunts I've been looking forward to all year. It is pronghorn. It is the public lands of Wyoming, and it's with Matthew. And that one that's got you excited, yeah. No. I mean, I'd, I'd shoot any of them on the last day, but... <laughs> So the challenge is really getting close, finding the one that you're really after, getting a good shot. Um, conditions can be a little strange here. There's a lot of roads, so there's traffic that can spook things. The winds can get really, really strong. And, you know, you just gotta, gotta roll with the punches as they come. Look at them all. Don't ask me why there'd be one buck bedded out here behind them all, but there is. He's still pretty hard to, to make out, but he's got a lot of length, got a lot of mass. Prongs aren't. Mass and length amazing. can disguise prongs, so yeah. we got to go get a closer look. Heat waves show a lot of mass because you're getting this waving effect, and so a buck that might be just normal mass looks really massive. I, my personal belief on hunting is if it's your tag, you can choose what you want to fill it with. It could be the smallest legal animal, it could be the biggest legal animal, it could be the first one you see, it could be the last one you see. Like, you know, do what makes you happy about it. Yeah, the one we were looking at was a lot wider than this, too. These three are, or these four are herding away. I kind of want to walk out here just another like 100 yards and see if we can see down in there a little bit. Let's do it. Sure. You sneak out there and I'll just come sneak along there. behind. All right. Because there might be another one down there because I just don't think that's the one I saw, but could be. I'd say that qualifies as rutting behavior. The three does saw me and started running off and he just herded them and stopped them right there. Yeah. Goofballs. Didn't even start to spook until I got to 225. So. Yeah. <laughs> I see you running. Running at a reason. And so we start driving, kind of working our way towards town. And Matthew's like, well, what about that buck down there? Is he a first day buck? I don't think so. Well, he has some pretty high standards. I don't know, he just doesn't have that much mass He's on the side. What? He's got a lot of mass. He's got a head like a meal. And he loves to just act like he's completely disinterested. And then he gets off camera or he gets in the truck or he walks away and he's just about laughing his head off because I'm over here all tied up in a knot thinking, boy, I just, I, I can't believe he's not gonna shoot that one. Really what it comes down to is just you know, am I ready to pull the trigger on this? It's not really about driving my dad crazy, although that is a little side benefit to it. I mean, we'll probably wheel up in the morning and someone will be drinking coffee and having a smoke while their buddy's gutting him out. Early in the hunt, when we're just driving around and we're spending 12 hours a day glassing at animals, that's not the full experience for me. And so I'd pass on some that I'd probably shoot towards the end of the hunt. I mean, there's no harm in Trying to get a closer look at him. None at all. 
no harm at all. Let me see what the map tells us here. I can tell Matthew's thinking, ah, oh, it's first day, I'm not sure. But I think to humor me, he said, well, I, my dad's this excited about this buck. I better at least grab my rifle and let's go take a peek. Straight to that yeah. gold spot. Just this little the... rise here and see if we can get a closer look. Yeah. Sounds good. He's out here somewhere. I think he's right up here. He's down in that bottom. Yep, there he is. 612 yards. I, uh, I hadn't sharpened my antelope pronghorn uh, judging skills. We got there, and he's a really nice buck from the side because he had good prongs, but when he looked at you, he is pretty tight. I'm like, well, sorry. He's definitely good, but he's not as good as we initially thought. See, as long as you thought he was? Uh, he's 15. Yeah. Well, I think that this is the first afternoon. We're probably gonna be able to find something similar and light is going down, so. Yeah. Well, uh, I think we'll call it a night for, for now. Come back tomorrow. I'm with you. Peace, brother. You know what? We, we already got in two stocks the first afternoon and it was an afternoon. We didn't even think that we were gonna get to hunt. Hello, how are you? I'm living on the moon. Well, Matthew, today is actually day one. Yeah. Yesterday was bonus day. First day. As you can see, folks, we got an audience here. They, they want to be on video so bad, they just walk past us while we're getting ready for the morning. Anything you want to shoot? I'll know it if I see it. What's wrong with that one? Can't do it on the, the first morning, can we? I guess not. Well, we may as well take a road that goes along a ridge line. That way we can look down off into each side. And if we see something we like, we can take one of these other roads that are like every half mile or mile. We'll just go set up on them. You know, pronghorn have evolved on these landscapes. They have specializations they've adapted for these landscapes. Pronghorn rely on their sight. You know, they have the equivalent vision of a human looking through eight to 10 power binoculars. And they're able to run for long distances at 35 to 45 miles an hour. And when they put the burners on and really give it the juice, they can go over 50 miles an hour. And in order to do that, in order to use those two anti-predation mechanisms to the greatest extent, Pronghorn want to have vegetation that's less than 18 inches. So I'm not going to go hunt the places where you see me right here where there's trees and there's tall sage. Pronghorn don't like that because coyotes and predators can hide in there. And if they do encounter a predator, they can't run through 30 inch sage the way they can run across 12, 15 inch sage. Holy cow. There's probably 20 of them out here. Seven more does. Another doe. Another doe, another doe, another doe. How are there 20 antelope but no bucks out there? There's got to be a buck somewhere. About this buck walking right towards the, the group. They're both kind of about the same. One's got bigger prongs, one got way more length, but they're both pretty light on the top. What are you thinking? I mean, I'm thinking pretty hard, but I think we should keep looking. Okay. I think we should too, because they just took off running. We drove around a lot. We looked at probably hundreds and hundreds of antelope, and I was just being very selective on like what it was that I was after. I think Matthew might have been thinking the same thing, that with this many bucks, 
it's gonna take something pretty special to shoot something the first day. And I was glad that he was being picky like that because it just extended our time to do that. Oh, that big herd of elk over there. Yeah, no kidding. Look at that bull in there, whoo, in the back. There's one really nice six point bull that has his cows and they're just wandering around out in the foothills and sage. And you look at that country and you're like, how can this support elk? But it does. The average person traveling through probably thinks, oh, what a dried out place. Well, once you go out there and you explore it and you get to understand how these communities of, of plant and animals are, are put together, it's so fascinating. Yeah. Not excited about that one. It's really didn't have a little more in prong. I wish we could have had like the Frankenbuck. Like take the best mass from one of them, the one that had the six inch prongs, and then the one that was over 16 inches tall, man, would have had a shooter. I think he's at least a day two buck. He's got a big black face and he's got a lot of mass. If he could get that lower sunlight to just make that look so pronounced. I think Matthew would shoot him. Good to know he's here. I don't think he's getting shot today. She thinks I'm a little lazy. I think she's a little crazy. We like summer and we like spring. Watching wrestling men ring. She ain't shy, she speaks her mind. Tough as nails and smooth as wine. We burn hot as kerosene. What are you thinking? Well, we got around quite a bit in the unit today and saw quite a few. And we have a good a idea of what's out there, so. Saw a lot. <laughs> Tomorrow might be a little less picky, although I think it would be good to sit in that migration spot for a little while and see what comes through. Yeah, we got three minutes of shooting light. Right there, you could get him if you wanted him. Yeah, he was here this morning and now here he is this afternoon. He, he's just jonesing to be on the tube. Yeah, well, he's gonna be on, so. <laughs> Without just, having to pay just for not. it. <laughs> just not on the ground. Oh. We explored maybe a quarter of it that day and just looked over tons and tons of animals, but nothing that really got me excited. I think we're, we're just gonna try to intercept the ones that are migrating through today, see what we can pick out of there. You did say you get less picky every day. This is insane. One of the things that happened in this unit is to the south of here are where most of the pronghorn in this part of Wyoming winter. So the biologists say that starting you know, first 10 days of October through the middle of October, even to late October, the pronghorn in some of these units to the north start drifting through here on their way to where they're gonna in the winter, so I think we're in the middle of the, the drift. <laughs> Looking for a big Hank. I don't know where Hank went. We're gonna find him. Looks like he's got length. They just can't tell anything else about him. See, you think tall. Hooks back on the end, just like a little finger hook. Is that quite what you're looking for, Matthew? Uh, I'm just having a lot of fun videoing them, so. Hunts aren't always about pulling the trigger. 
No, but eating them it requires some pulling the trigger. Based on how many we've seen, I'm not worried about <laughs> eating one if we decide that <laughs> that's the primary <sighs> objective. <sighs> They didn't make it. No. Nope. Wonder what causes, is it the size of the core that creates mass or is it just how good a diet they had and they got a bunch of fat and tissue between that and the horn feet? No so, idea. I'm sure someone out there can tell you though. Probably. They used to have cheetahs chasing them here. Mm -hmm. They don't need that level of speed anymore. <laughs> Probably not. But it comes in handy when guys with center fire rifles are walking around out here. Yeah, I'm sure. Finally, I told Matthew, I said, my eyes are sore from looking at all these things. I'm taking a nap. So I took the tripod out, the spotting scope, and just happened to see this one guy it's pretty nice. And as I'm standing there watching these, this buck and a doe come and just kind of look at me from about 80 yards away. And it's this very nice buck. It's one of the better ones that we have seen. So we're just watching him. Not pulling the gun out yet, but he's pretty good. I hear him whispering and I sit up and I look and there's a bunch of pronghorn walking right behind the truck. Did I mess you up when I woke up there? No. Well, the one I was looking at was close. Close? He was one of, he was the top, in the top three or four that we've seen today. Really? Yeah. Big prongs curled pretty far over. We, uh, we start looking a little closer at everything that had filtered in while we'd been asleep, and we saw a couple that were promising. And I see this one buck moving up the hill, and he's a really good buck. I told Matthew, I think I know where he's going. And I, I never got a great look at it, but I do know that he hunts enough of these that if he gets really excited over one, it's something pretty special. The crowd may not believe this, but Matthew says he wants to go take a closer look at one of them. So we go over there, park the truck behind the ridge, and well, the buck had kind of curved out that way, and I peek over, and there's a bedded buck, and there's this buck. Great prongs, really good lower mass. I'm probably 15 and a half inches tall. I'm like, whoo. I kind of drop down and I sneak back. I was so close, I was afraid I was gonna scare him. He's straight, if you were like a yep. little bit, there's a little buck bedded downhill and he was uphill from him. So I say, okay, let's go. Let's go chase after it. By the time we get back to where they are, it's probably half an hour later. There's one standing there, but I don't think it's him. And I'm thinking, okay, the other buck must have moved off to our left. has wings and flew off or something. I mean, we stood there and we could see, uh oh, there's a buck over there. There's a buck under the power line. There's a buck down there. And never relocated him. I mean, I'd be happy to give it one more go. I mean, there's a road right up there. So try to get closer. Yeah. And the idea is we're gonna come up behind this berm underneath this power line. And as we're driving in there, there's an antelope bedded on a ridge up there, and Matthew's like, stop, I see an antelope on this ridge. I mean, his one normal horn is like, pretty solid. And he's got a horn that comes out the side of his head and grows out underneath its jaw. I mean, it's up to Matthew, but my order of priority is always weird and funky, then big, then tasty because I know that the two above are gonna be tasty. 
So we're parked here. He just right over that. Yeah. It was very interesting. I would have shot it if given the opportunity. And by the time we got up there, there was no sign of him. I know the one big buck is bigger than any buck I've seen here. Okay. Well, I don't know where he went. I think when I saw him with that doe and that bedded buck, I think they came back down in here. Okay. That's well, my thought. But let's uh, let's hope they're around here. My only question with this spot is if all the ones came this way because we were bumping them and they wanted to go kind of where we were intercepting them, or if this is just naturally where they want to go. I think this is right here. I think this is naturally where they go. Oh. That way. I would bet if we come here in the morning, it's going to be a playground of pronghorn. <laughs> Probably. And now it's starting to get dark. And so we drive down into one of these bottoms. Matthew's like, there's four pronghorn up there on that ridge line. So he looks over there. And immediately, Matthew is like, oh my gosh. Oh, that's a good one. No. It was very long, had good prongs, went way wide, hooked in. No. It must have been a good one because he turns to me and Corey says, I just shot that one on the first day. Before they took off, I was getting ready to hop out and grab the gun in my pack and figure out how to get up there. So we chase them back to where we think they're going, and we just can't find this buck again. This is where they were standing when we saw them. You, you think, how could something get away? There, there's so many little folds to that terrain there that they stay in those bottoms and they feed there, or they just hang out there, and they get away. What do you want to do? Well, I don't think there's enough light for us to go after him now, mm -hmm. not and get it on camera, mm -hmm. so. No, it's full on sunset right now. Yeah, so I think we just make a note of where he's at and we come back in the morning. We're getting closer and closer to the hunting area and it's getting foggy. What do we do? I mean, I don't think it really changes our plan too much. Just go to the spot we were going to go to and hope everything burns off before too long or we get really lucky. Like really lucky, yeah. Visibility is anywhere between 75 and 200 yards, depending on how thick it is and if there's a little breeze and kind of what elevation you're at. Little guy, he's crossing behind us here. In all my hunting for elk, deer, and pronghorn, I have never been fogged in like that. It's been legal shooting light for an hour now, and. Uh, the sun is starting to come up and it looks like the fog might burn off. We got 15 antelope right behind us here. One buck in the group, but been weird. You just see these antelope and then they disappear and then you see them and then they disappear. You know that we've driven by several hundred. Oh, we've I'm sure. To... Can't imagine how many we've driven by. We'd slowly move the truck down some of these ridges and we'd stop and look. A different buck. I think it was until about three and a half, four hours into the morning before the fog finally burned off. So we'd lost a lot of our time of where we thought we'd find the buck from the night before. And we looked and we went out on this point and went out on that point. We're hiking and glassing, hiking and glassing. The whole group of them gathered down here and back to see and 10 bucks from every glassing knob. Because we're not fogged in. See anything more of the ones on the hillside over here? Decent bucks, but nothing big. 
You're standing in a pronghorn scrape, Matthew. So many of them around here. There's another one. They're everywhere. There's so many bucks, but the heat waves are so bad. You just can't tell, you know, something's a mile away, the heat waves are just distorting everything. I watched this one buck coming for a long ways, probably two miles away. So we jump in the truck and we start going over there and, and we look and there's a really nice buck with a doe. I know he's got good prongs, if nothing else, and good height. Well, time to go take a look. but I think that one's too narrow. Let's keep going and see. We're just moving and moving and moving and we're getting intercepted by these smaller bucks. And then half the time or more than half the time, it seems they take off in the direction of where the one is that you're trying to get a shot at. That wasn't the one. That also wasn't the one. Not gonna be too surprised if they're way the heck down here. My dad stays there where he can see around one end and then Corey, the camera guy, and I go around the other side. There's a group of cows back behind us a couple hundred yards. We're in this little depression. And so we just sit there and we just watch these ones for a long time. Whoa, get the one coming up in the back now. It was really cool to sit there and watch that. I mean, it was just a parade of pronghorn coming past, just coming and coming and we see this one bedded up on a hillside maybe a, a thousand yards away. Matthew waves me over. He's right on the top of the ridge, just looking right at us. And I told Matthew, I said, you know, based on what you explained last night of the buck you saw that we couldn't relocate, this kind of looks like him and he's only a half mile from where we were last night. Any thoughts on just sitting here for a little while and watching what he does? I'm fine with that. I just, I feel like we've chased these around a lot and then we've lost track of where they are and that's come back to bite us, so. I, I think that's cool too because we can see pronghorn in every direction and most of them are coming towards us. And eventually he gets up and starts feeding. Um, this other buck comes and joins him and together they kind of walk off to the side where we can't really see them anymore. and I'm ranging, you know, anywhere from 490 to 520 and... And then the buck that Matthew's thinking is the one from the night before lays down. I'm like, come on, buddy, don't be so lazy. Well, it's six o'clock, almost six. We have until about seven for shooting light. I don't think he's got any teeth left. That is probably one of the oldest looking pronghorn I've ever seen. It stays that way for, I don't know, half an hour or 45 minutes, where his friend keeps feeding and then eventually takes the same path right next to where we had been set up before. He's downwind of us and in my spotting scope, I can see him flaring his nose and his lips trying to smell us. And I'm like, well, this gig is up. And he takes off running away from us. And he stands out there about 250 yards. And as soon as the, the feeding buck spooked, I knew, okay, the other one's gonna be on high alert. I should look at him. So I look over as quick as I can and I see that he's up and moving. And I tell everyone, hey, he's up, he's running. And I hear Matthew say, holy crap, get ready. The other buck is running over here. And fortunately, he takes the same exact path and we know that once he gets in past about 400 yards, he'll kind of run sideways and get a little closer as he goes. He is just hauling it. He's coming our direction. If he stops here, how far is he? And he starts slowing down and he's looking at his buddy who had just walked up to us. It's the one in the back, right? Uh, yeah, broadside. So broadside. Broadside right now. Two 
16 I'm sure you drilled him. Yeah. He drilled him, Matthew. He's going down. There he goes. For me, it was everything that I want out of a hunt. I got to see a lot of animals. I got to spend time with my dad. I got to see the animals close up. I got to have a good shot at a fairly close range. And I'm going home with a lot of meat. So I really can't complain. It was a, a great way to spend a week. I mean, it was, a, it was really cool watching that group filter through and then being able to watch this guy for two hours pretty much just yeah, feeding him. and bedding and then the guy that he followed out. It is so meaningful to spend these times with family and friends. The fact that we were out there and we'd spent three and a half days laughing, chuckling, giving each other a hard time, and to see it come together the way Matthew had planned, this was special.